The Morgan Thomas Show. Brought to you by Black's Tire Inc. What's up, everyone? It's The Morgan Thomas Show. I'm your host and producer, Morgan Thomas. I'm excited to have you on tonight. Another Tuesday night. We took last Tuesday night off because of the Clemson uh, basketball game. And so now we're back and it's not just me by myself. I have my co-hosts. I wanted to introduce them to you. But first, let's start off with the man, the myth, the legend, five time Carnival Cruise Line ping pong champion, Big Al, Alan Adams. Welcome to the show. Yeah, it's very humbling to be on such a special show as this and get to talk football, not only football, but Clemson football, Clemson basketball, and all things Clemson with the wonderful fans out there. Uh, it, it's very nice, you know, to, to get all the support and the love and the Carnival Cruise Line trophies. I mean, they, they sit over in a shelf, you know, by my bed. I mean, where else would they be, really? <laughs> but, <laughs> oh gosh, I still need to put the, I still need to put the Zion basketball trophy up there. I mean, that's the one that really means the most, right? And you got to be a part of that, too, as well. So, uh, some good times for sure. Glad to be here. As long as you remember, you can't have all those points without somebody giving you those assists. All right. So, <laughs> hey, I have to pass you the ball. Well, I at least have to inbound the ball. That, that's right. at least what I'm good for. So make sure you remember that. Um, I'm surprised that you don't just, you know, give them a little rub and kiss at good night before you, uh, <laughs> you know, go to bed. But anyways, I also we, we got to talk about something. I heard you said something about you didn't watch the Super Bowl. Was I should I have done that? Is that something that I should have done? Watch the Super Bowl? Yeah. Well, look, I mean, you got to give me a little bit here because I was in relative depression mode uh, when I know Green Bay should have actually won that game against Tampa uh, if it weren't for two of the worst coaching decisions I've ever seen in my entire life. Um, the halftime pass and, of course, the not not going for it at the end there uh, when you have Aaron Rodgers as your quarterback. Just absolutely brutal. Uh, you know, I. The Chiefs and the and the Bucks, you know, that neither team really does it for me. So I, I watched, uh, I watched a little bit. I watched uh, the beginning. I saw Brady get the second touchdown. I was like, this thing's over. Brady, Brady doesn't lose these games, and he's not going to lose one. And I look back later, it's like thirty-one to nine. So yeah, <laughs> it's something, something wow. I didn't do. But uh, y'all be able to provide some uh, monstrous insight. I feel quite sure. I wasn't expecting Kansas City to have no touchdowns. So we'll, we'll, we'll get yeah. into that a little bit more. But before we do, I don't we also have a third co-host on this show tonight. We don't want to forget about him. The man who has probably more odd Clemson knowledge than Tim Bure himself. Houston has a problem. Houston Burnett, welcome to the show, my friend. Yeah, come at me, Tim Bure. First off, <laughs> come, follow me on Twitter, for real, though. Uh, I, I would enjoy that. Uh, but yeah, no, uh, Al, I can't believe you didn't watch the Super Bowl. Um, yes, it was, uh, not very entertaining, but here's, here's my thing. <laughs> People are going to complain about how there's no parody in, in the, NF in the college football and there's no, like the excitement and the games aren't there. We just witnessed a 25 point beat down or 22 point beat down in the Super Bowl, um, as opposed to you know a similar score in the in the uh, CFP championship, and then on top of that, everyone's complaining about the amount of times Alabama has been to the championship. I was 11 years old when Tom Brady went to his first Super Bowl. Let's let's just get that in mind. He's been back nine more times since then in two more decades. So yeah, let's not talk about parody or anything like that. <laughs> I mean, Tom Brady really is has been very impressive. I mean, especially leaving New England, going to Tampa Bay, br resurrecting Rob Gronkowski from retirement there. Mm -hmm. You know, it was kind of nice. I mean, to me, if if I were that good and I changed teams to get away from New, New England, I would, one, go somewhere warmer, definitely. <laughs> Probably wouldn't have ever played in New England if it was knowing me. I would have at least been in Tampa Bay from the start. But – I would definitely bring along Allen and Houston to enjoy and win Super Bowls with me. You got to bring your friends with you. So, yeah. and then guess what? Because if you win, then guess where you get to go? Disney World. Disney World. That's free. So, <laughs> you know. um, but yeah, thank you again for coming in and joining us tonight. We got a fun show for you. Uh, like I said, had a couple of couple of days or a week off, so we're kind of like amped up to get back to talk to you about Clemson athletics and, and all things Clemson sports for sure. Let's get in and holler to the people that are watching us right now. We've got Kevron who's checked in as always. Kevron, literally the number one player or number one a fan yeah. for us for sure. We could say he's number one player. I mean, he could be on our team. Um, <laughs> and then we got Bill, Al, Kuhn, 
And uh, I don't know if I see anybody else. Got any comments in there or anything uh, starting us off hot tonight? Let's see. I'm looking over here. I've been I've been kind of perusing the comments over here. We got uh, Kevron with the cadence count, which is always good. I'm always for that. Uh, let's see. I see Christopher Harold checking in with us. Also, who else did I see? I know you mentioned Four Paul's Bill. I like to call him Four Paul's Bill just so everybody knows. Uh, Everybody's he's, got enough. He's not just Bill. I said actually, I saw John Hansen and Tasha Medlock join us over here. Uh, over here on Facebook, it's not showing up on our feed on, on the on the Streamyard screen, but it is showing up over here on Facebook. So shout out to those people for listening as well. Giggle gets in over on YouTube as well as what's up. You know, is Bill like one of those guys that just like chills with you and talks to you when you show up, Al? When you oh, go- absolutely. Yeah, I think he knows better than to not do that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, been, like- it's been a little while since I've been able to get over there too, so I'm sure he's ill with me right now. It, it's probably ill, Bill right now. So uh, I'll try to get over there as soon as I can (laughs) and see you, Bill. I don't really feel like that, you know, you could go to Four Paws and just have an hour lunch. It'd probably have to be a lot longer than that, especially with him there. You probably, you know, really have some great conversations for sure. Um, But Mitch gets in, John gets in as well. Thank you guys for, for jumping in. Before we get started, let me tell you about our primary primary show sponsor, and that is Black's Tire, Inc. Black's Tire, Inc., family owned and operated since 1971. If you need new tires, brakes, alignments, tire repair, or just looking for a friendly professional to help answer your questions, stop by Black's Tire, Inc., located 1415 East Main Street, Westminster, South Carolina. Give them a call, 864-647-9292. Go check them out. Dale and Preston Black, Black's Tire, Inc. Man, it's like sun dad, grandpa, uncles, aunts, all have worked there. So, you know, it's family operated, you know, it's good. And uh, they have supported our show for quite some time. Got a good show tonight. We actually have Woodrow Dantzler coming on as a special guest. He's not here yet. We're waiting on him to get in, but I've got word that he is on his way. So just hang tight and we'll get into that. Before we do, there are a couple of things that I wanted to talk about. One is discuss the fact that Alan did not watch the Super Bowl. (laughs) Tampa Bay beats Kansas City 31 to 9. As you see there, look at look at Tom. Beautiful Tom. I mean, ageless Tom. Are we gonna get pulled for this photo or something like that? I don't want, I know I know that we're synonymous no, with playing the no, Whitney Houston national anthem, and we got pulled. That was no, in Tampa Bay. It is, that was in Tampa too. It so. is a legitimate, it is a legitimately pulled photo from places I can't tell you on social media. So it, we, we can definitely use it. We, I know we can. Um, oh, okay. No, this was Houston. This photo was taken from my phone. If anybody, yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but Al, so it really, it really was kind of, I want to see what you guys think in the chat for sure. But it, I mean, it, I wouldn't necessarily say it was boring. I was definitely very surprised to see that Kansas city had literally no answer for what Tampa Bay's defense could do. I mean, only having nine points, that's three field goals in case, you know, I mean, who's counting? Definitely not me, but that's no, that's no touchdowns for the Kansas city chiefs. That was definitely a shocker for me. Al, I'll skip you because I know you have no clue what I'm talking about here, but (laughs) was it shocking to you that there was no touchdowns by the Patrick Mahomes? In a way, yes. I think I think after the first half, like the way that I saw it, I was like, "All right, halftime." Uh, you know, if if the if the um, you know Chiefs can make a run in the second half, um, then they may be able to come back. But I think as soon as Tom Brady threw that touchdown to Antonio Brown and just took Tyron Matthew's soul with him, I don't think Tyron Matthew. That's going to be something that that Tyron Matthew may not be able to live down for a while. Uh, he may have to go to another team or something like that because that's that's not something that that you just recover from overnight. Tom Brady lit him up, and this is, we're talking about the Honey Badger, a guy that's synonymous in college football and even in the pros. And Tom Brady picked on him all night. Um, I think once once you got to that point at the end of the second quarter and the very beginning of the second half, I knew it was over because the Chiefs just kind of – they weren't there mentally. You can kind of see that. And Mahomes was on his back throwing, you know, unbelievable passes that were incomplete, a bunch of drops. So it doesn't surprise me in a sense of, of you know, how things happened. But it is surprising that even for a team like the Chiefs who have come back from 24-17 and all that kind of stuff like that, they just couldn't do anything 
against the Buccaneers defense that night. Yeah, I think that, you know, the defensive front, man, they they were getting after him. It almost made me feel like, okay, that's how important, you know, they had, what, two tackles out of the game. So, you know, that's a big blow. And I, it just reminded me of kind of what, like, uh, people were joking, like, this is how Deshaun feels, you know, uh, <laughs> with no offensive line to protect him and getting sacked almost every play. I mean, even still, Patrick Mahomes, there was one play, I don't know if you saw this, Houston, where he was, like, diving sideways, underhanded, side 35-yard bullet to the end zone. Um, very, very crazy to see that, that pass. I mean, I don't even know, I don't even understand that, like how he had the speed and the, the ability to do that from, with his arm upside down, basically. Well, I can tell you the reason why he was on his back so much. And I tweeted this out the other night. Um, uh, Mike Rimmers is his name. And the only reason I know who this offensive lineman is, is because I'm a huge Panthers fan and Cam Newton had his soul taken by Von Miller constantly in the Super Bowl in 2015 or, or uh, after the 2015 season. And it was mainly in part because of Mike Rimmers. And you know what? They said Mike Rimmers was starting the Super Bowl. And in the back of my mind, I was like, surely he won't. Surely he won't be the reason. And he was. He he got constantly bullied by JPP um, and by the the other, uh, I believe, Barrett or Barnett. I can't remember the other, the pass rusher's name. But, I mean, the other thing is, I, and I didn't know this really until I paid attention more, that defensive front for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers is disgusting. Uh, you, you not only have those two ends, uh, you also have Vita Bea and, and, and Dominican Sue. And Dominican Sue is still just as good as he was when he came into the league back in 09, 2010, in that, in that region. So, you know, that defense is salty. Um, I just yeah, – you're not going to win with Mike Rimmers in that defensive front going against him. I mean, you know, watching those two teams still, though, I mean, the first thing is you, I kind of felt bad for Patrick Mahomes, seeing how good he was, and then watching literally the football hit – like most of the time hit you in the face, hit his receivers in the face mask and bounce off. I'm like, if that would have been a, you know, one of the announcers said a long time, one of the games I watched a couple of years ago, it hit, it hit the uh, Pittsburgh Steeler guy right in the chest. And he just like, just dropped on the ground. And the guy said, if that would have been a spear, it would have killed him. And I just thought that was the most hilarious thing to say at the time. But man, I mean, if those were darts, it'd be a lot of KC receivers with no eyeballs right now because he was hitting them. They were there. But they just couldn't catch it. And then on top of that, you know, you're gonna, you're always going to get what you always get in, in these big games, the referees, the penalties. And there were a few times where it was like, you know, was it worth throwing a penalty? Was the ball over his head? There was one you're talking about. Tyron Matthew was very upset where he got called for holding and it, the ball was kind of uncatchable, I guess, debatable if it was or wasn't. But to – to the announcer's point, Tony Romo specifically, KC came in kind of with that Brent Venables mentality of, you know what, we're going to be super, super physical. Let the referees call it if they want, but we're not going to stop. Yeah, I think that was the thing. And, and it, you see the video of, of Tom Brady basically telling Tyron Matthew, I'm going at you. And that's and that's what he did. He did that with, with Rob Gronkowski. He did that with Antonio Brown. This is what's crazy. Rob Gronkowski catches two touchdown passes. I'm not sure he's done that in the in the past Super Bowls with Brady in New England. And on top of that, Antonio Brown is now a Super Bowl champion. We, something we didn't think we'd ever say, uh, especially when he was going through his insane moments in Pittsburgh and, and Oakland and all those things. But Antonio Brown has now won a Super Bowl and caught a touchdown. Um, and he was he was pretty reliable. I mean, to be honest, you know, maybe not reliable mentally in, in some cases, but he was definitely reliable on the field. Um, John gets in and says the mid-game streaker broke some tackles as well. <laughs> um, <laughs> did, you guys, did you guys see exactly – apparently this guy got with a YouTuber, um, you know, we, hey, we don't have that much money, but as YouTubers ourselves, but this guy got with a YouTuber – and placed a what fifty thousand dollar prop bet. Al, these are the kind of prop bets that you're interested in. But <laughs> a prop bet on will there be a streaker or not? And then was the streaker? So to me, that that kind of is cheating. I I would honestly probably not give him the payout at that point. What do you think, Houston? 
I mean, (laughs) you know, it's one of those things. I think that's just Facebook fodder. Uh, I think somebody probably came up with that, and I, I can't remember whose whose timeline I saw that on first. I was like, that sounds, I don't know, that sounds too good to be true to me. I'm not sure if I believe that because it's one of those things that you just see it's like plastered on top of some random picture. You know, mm-hmm. wouldn't surprise me if there's like a minion kind of like photoshopped into there, kind of like what you see on Karen's <laughs> Facebook page. So I don't know. You know, that's 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 kind of how I took it. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, um, I, I think if I was the the agency or whatever he he used to to go after that or or to, to place that wager, I think I think at that point that would be void. There should be some sort of clause like, "Hey, can't be you who fulfills this <laughs> this yeah. bet," um, you know, because there. I mean, that that kind of prop bet is one of those things that that uh, that actually does happen. So. Um, yeah. But yeah, very interesting. So Al, are you just like anti any game but the Packers? I don't watch a lot of NFL, but the Packers. I usually like to find a team that I want to pull for in the Super Bowl, and especially if there's a you know a prominent Clemson player at the helm. Uh, usually, it's a a quarterback. So if Deshaun Watson was in the Super Bowl, I'd watch uh, something like that. But I, I usually have the Super Bowl on. This is honestly the first Super Bowl that I've never that I haven't really had on the TV uh for the whole game i mean that usually happens regardless of whether i care about the teams or not but this year like i said i felt green bay deserved to be there uh after that game and i was just kind of disappointed and i didn't really care for either of the teams and i i always thought kansas city was the better team but you never bet against tom brady in the super bowl and that's what happens i mean what what was the point and it seems it seems to me from what everybody's been saying and the score would show you that uh, it was not a bad idea to not watch the super bowl (laughs) Well, so that's our Super Bowl talk. You know, thank you for getting in. Everybody that's on Facebook, YouTube, or Periscope, Twitter, wherever you're at, wherever you're watching, thank you for joining in and being a part of the show. Again, we have uh, Woodrow Dantzler, former Clemson great, Clemson Hall of Famer, actually, that is going to join the show just shortly. Uh, And we are ready for him. He's ready for us now. But before we do that, let's tell you about uh, a couple of other sponsors. Houston's going to tell you about Charleston Sports Pub. That is right. If you're looking for a great place to eat, uh, you have to check out Charleston Sports Pub. Uh, look, listen to the reviews. It's, it's great food, great atmosphere, and great customer service. Try their burgers every Monday for half price, dine-in, takeout, or delivery. 359 College Avenue, Clemson, South Carolina, or one of their other locations in downtown Greenville, James Island, Mount Pleasant, Somerville, West Ashley, or Goose Creek. Upstate or low country, there isn't a reason you shouldn't try Charleston Sports Pub. And then we also want to tell you about Tiger Sports Shop. We don't just dress for success. We TS for success. That's Tiger Sports Shop. Big Al, Houston, and I all wearing Clemson gear from the Tiger Sports Shop. We shop there so much that they practically forced us to be a sponsor for them So stop by one of their two locations, 364 College Avenue, Clemson, South Carolina, 1102 Tiger Boulevard, Clemson as well. If you're not in town, no worries. Go check out tigersports.com. Tell Sean and Julie that the guys at the Morgan Thomas Show sent you. And we want to introduce our guest for the night. He's on with us. Before we do that, let me tell you a little bit about him. Mr. Woodrow Dantzler III, 2007 Clemson Hall of Famer, first quarterback to throw for at least 2,000 yards and rush for 1,000 yards. Um, He recently was honored at his company for Black History Month and had a couple of questions in there. We're so great. We're we're honored to have him there. Not only did he play for Clemson, but he also played for the Dallas Cowboys and the Atlanta Falcons. But we are excited to have him on the show. So let's get get this started, gentlemen, uh, and bring Mr. Bansler on the show. Woody, welcome to the show, sir. Hello, Jelly. How are you doing? Doing good. Well, we appreciate having you on, and thank you for taking the time out to talk about some Clemson football and just your your uh, history in general. Um, but, he, Woody, let's get right into it. My first question for you is, how are you doing? What you been up to since leaving Clemson, since 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 uh, working uh, or leaving leaving the NFL? Kind of give our fans a check in on on where you're at. Well, I'm in the upstate South Carolina now, and since the league, I have been in sales, and which kind of leads to my current job. I'm in a company called Tap Up, where I do sales. And on top of that, you know, I'm 
still very involved with the community, mentor work, and I actually do some speaking as well. A whole, my whole lot in life is making sure we teach. So for years now, when I was up playing ball, now I'm going to do that as I grow older. So very good. Got two girls, one of ship off to college in August and I got middle school work. They keep me busy and there's that going on. So my family got a full time job and then you know I squeeze in Tela and my speed in my spare time. <laughs> Well, breaking up there a little bit, we, we hope to get in this interview and kind of uh, uh, talk to you a little bit more about your experiences with Clemson and your experience now. Uh, again, we appreciate you coming on and being a part of the show. Um, but yeah, if you could get a little bit closer, maybe we could uh, hear you a little bit better. But you mentioned that you, you're you into mentoring. You mentioned you're into um, kind of being a professional speaker or a motivational speaker. Um you know, it, was that something that you, you originally knew you were going to do coming into or, or leaving Clemson or, or how did that come about? Well, you know, it just kind of happened. You know, I always end up gravitating towards people and seeing the best in them and doing what I could to help them out. So that's kind of how that worked. And then as I grew up a little bit more and then I started to look into some of the things that I wanted to do, you know, it just seemed it just fit. So that's how that ended up happening. And we can definitely hear you a lot better. So thanks for that, Woody. Um, so when when you look at when you talk to players now, when you're with the the Paul journey that you mentioned earlier, are are some of the issues or or struggles that they deal with now some of the same things that you did as well, or has it has it kind of evolved over time and it's different now with technology and social media? I know. When, when we were in school, when you played, what, when we watched you, uh, social media wasn't what it is now. Right, right. So with the kids today, <laughs> I'm interested, I'm saying kids today, but um, for them, it's the same. It's the same things. It's the same issues. But as you mentioned, with social media and so much information being available, they have so much more at one time than we did. It was kind of filtered to us. We'll get it in, in, in spurts. I mean, they're getting it all right in here right now. It's like, you know, coming from a fire hose, whether like we were drinking through just a regular uh, garden hose, they're drinking through a fire hose. So that's the big difference. But it's the same issues. Now, to tell the fans that might be watching, because you know how YouTube is and, and social media is now, we have a wide range of fans between 19 years old all the way up to 55 plus. And I'm kind of noticing like, you know, some of the younger group doesn't really understand the impact that maybe maybe we understand. So Al Houston and I are all Clemson graduates. And so we watched you growing up. You're a little bit older than us. So we we kind of watched you as we were in grade school and 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 dominate on the field. But to be the first quarterback in NCAA history to pass for 2,000 yards and rush for 1,000 yards, I know when a fan sees that now, it's like, what? What is that? Yeah. Is, why is that such a big deal? And I go back and look and I say, but Clemson, Woody, Woody couldn't throw that. He, he didn't throw that much. Like they, they only let him throw like 200 times. Trevor gets to throw like 5,000 times. You know? <laughs> so, um, you know was it at the in the moment did you realize how big it was to for you know for what you did for the game a, as a whole honestly speaking i still i mean i understand the magnitude of it but for me it never hits me as if oh man i just made this a great accomplishment for me i was just a guy out there grinding trying to be the best player i could possibly be because i got 10 other guys on the field with me and 11 on the other side of the ball plus the other you know, 50 or 60 plus guys on the team that were depending on me. So my goal was to get out there and put the best effort forward every time. If, if I'm on the practice field, if I'm on the game field, you know, that was my goal. And what came with it is what came with it. But I want to make sure I wasn't letting anyone down. That was my goal. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we kind of do this show like a round table. If you don't mind sticking with us while we go around with it, we're not only going to, I'm not only going to be the only one asking you questions, but we got big Al, we've got Houston online. We also have fan questions that come in through Facebook or YouTube. If you're a fan right now, you remember Woody, or you want to ask him a question, please get in and we'll try to throw them up for you as well. But I'll start off with big Al. Uh, what would you like to ask him? 
Yeah, so uh, you know, it, we all know that the recruiting is kind of the lifeblood of lifeblood of every football program. We talk about it, we live it, we breathe it, we read about it all the time. Uh, just kind of wanted to know, you know, your recruiting story. You know, how you got recruited by Clemson was Clemson where you wanted to go, and kind of what other college programs might have been interested in you for football. That is a great question. That's one I I have an answer to, but I don't really have an answer to because growing up, you know, a lot of these a lot of these kids already, you know, they've seen recruiting, you know. Let me back up a little bit. Recru recruiting wasn't as big as it was. You know, Rivals was in its infancy stages and all these other right. different recruiting sites and these, you know, the rating system, that wasn't anything. You know, when I did my signing, I signed in my high school auditorium with the local paper. Now there's so much stuff, you know, that people can do with the different hats. But um, for me, the consideration of going to college wasn't on the forefront of my mind. I was pretty naive to the whole process. But again, it was just me. I was out. I was enjoying my senior year playing ball. And then these coaches started calling and, you know, uh, different things started happening that way to where I saw that people were interested in me playing ball at their schools. So I had a few letters, had a few people call and different offers. But um, as far as making a decision to where I wanted to go, you know, I didn't even know any much about Clemson or Carolina. I know South Carolina State because that was in my hometown. Mm -hmm. But when I, what made me choose Clemson was uh, to, uh, one guy by the name of Rick Stockstill. You know, he came in, we built a, a, a lasting bond, and I can just, I trusted him and I believed him, and I went to Clemson because of Rick Stockstill. So that's what happened with me. Fantastic. Houston, go ahead and hit, hit him with something. So, and, and I, I'm going to I'm gonna get this question, Morgan, this wasn't on the original list. I had a, a text <laughs> from a person watching. Now, I, I know some players from back when I was in, in school that in the 09 through 12 days, like the Malachi Goodmans and, the, and Dwayne Allens and mm -hmm. Taj even. But one of the questions that I got was, who was the biggest jokester on your team? Me. You were. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was that guy. Okay. <laughs> Okay, well that's interesting. Well, so my my first question is this, man, and and, and and you know, I was nine, ten years old when you were playing. I was there at your first game when you took over for Brandon Streeter against UNC. I went and saw I, I got to see you grow in your career and you were one of my, my favorite players to, to watch. But the other thing that coincided was to me the golden age of of Hall of Fame athletes coming through the ACC at that time. So if you had to pick one that the, obviously not not yourself, but like a, a uh, whether it's Derek Hamilton or Mike Vick or Julius Peppers or, or Peter Work, was there ever an athlete that you played on the field that you were like, man, this guy was amazing to see, even though he was a playing against me, it was it was just incredible to watch. That's a good question. I don't know. I mean, so many come to me. You talking about just the ACC or just who I played against? Period. Yeah, who you played against? I know, I know, Mike Vick. The Virginia Tech wasn't the ACC at that okay, time. That, well, I that long. Uh, he don't, he don't count. But I, I guess the first <laughs> thing that that popped into my head, you know, when you were just talking about just outstandingly freak of nature, was uh, Julius Peppers. Mm -hmm. When you think about him, a guy that size, that speed, that strength, you know, mm -hmm. playing on the opposite side, you know, I mean, he lettered in three sports, you know, football, yeah. basketball, and track. So I mean. He was one of those guys that when you when you were out there, I remember one play. I actually I was going to throw the ball. I threw the ball. He tipped it, intercepted. I ended up tackling him, and I remember looking him in the face and saying, "You know, you really didn't have to do that." <laughs> you know, but that's just kind of he's one of those guys that stand out to me. He's just a freak of nature. That's awesome. So and I actually got this in the uh, tech, uh, the um, comment line here, and I was going to ask this about this. I'm sure that you've described this, but to me, the biggest iconic play of, of your career, at least in my opinion, was the catch, uh, the throw and catch to, to, to Rod Gardner in the 2000 South Carolina. So I don't know if you've described this on other shows before, but I don't know if you can talk about the call and the, the lead up to that. And then, you know, the execution and, and kind of the, the, the play itself. Well, I mean, it was it's a simple call, you know, we just lining up in a in a trip formation to kind of move the to move the field and get people out of out of position, and on top of that with the roll. So essentially, it was essential just it was always going to Rod, half roll to the left, turn back and throw it up to Rod, and that's what that essentially was was that was the play. Uh, interestingly enough, you know, to to get it up there because he was one of who was on the sideline. I just remember him putting his arms up, and you know, just kind of waving, showing his his reach and said, "Hey." You put it in this area, I'm going to catch it, you know. And uh, he's going back and forth with Coach Bounds because he had a couple of drops early in that game. And it was interesting to watch their band to go back and forth. But, you know, 
uh, to go out. It was just a, a half roll to the right, throw back to Rodgers, give him a chance, and he went up, he made the play. But what was really interesting about that play, Charlie Strong, he was a defensive coordinator at the time. And I saw him a few years later, and, you know, I was talking to him. He said, you know, you almost got me fired, right? <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm just, I said, what you mean? How, how? He said, because, you know, because I, I forgot the corner's name. I don't want to say it was good, but I don't think it was good. But I'm not sure. But he said after that play, he went to the corner and said, why did you let Rod behind you? And his response to, to Coach Strong was, I didn't think he could throw that far. He said it took everything in him not to put his hands around his throat. <laughs> so he knew if he would have done that, he would have gotten fired on the spot. <laughs> wow. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, and I, I've only got one more, and this is it. This is kind of the softball kind of stuff, but like, all right. Post game, let's say you play a day game, you're gonna grab something to eat. Are you max driving? Are you going to Paul's? Are you going to the old school just the barbecue in Pendleton? What was your post game spot after I'm, I'm after cooking? You? You cook? Okay. I'm cooking All right now. Right. I'm in the kitchen. Okay. <laughs> oh, there you go. Well, no further questions, no further questions then. <laughs> I mean, yeah, nothing I better than your own food. I don't want to take my money and not own other food. You know, I, 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 build, I build my grocery list by myself. I go home and I cook. That's me. Okay. That's awesome, That's- man. That sounds like the Dave Ramsey plan. Uh, you know, make sure you <laughs> don't, don't blow them. <laughs> hey, the budget I was working with in high school wasn't like they what the budget they have now. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, I'm thinking about as you mentioned that I, I mentioned that about my my daughter, and I'm thinking, you know, all the things that I I didn't have, but you as a dad, you want to give them what you didn't have, but then I'm like, man, now am I giving her too much? Maybe I shouldn't. Maybe it was a good thing that I didn't have all that stuff but uh as i as i see her toy room just getting bigger and bigger but um but oh, i yeah, wanted I, to ask I you on that one because i said no, i just agreeing with you you good because I, I i tell my kids all the time you spoil them. and then i and the next <laughs> sentence right behind me i'm saying you know it's my fault you know so my wife my girls are spoiled but it's all my fault so i can't really complain <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I got I keep I put a little bit in the piggy bank whenever I have some change, and so you know, I my fault. But um, so I I thought about this as we were talking. You know, with COVID nineteen, everything happening. You know, not knowing what was going on this year. Uh, you know, did you did you have any role on the team? I know that they had limited access to you know who they could talk to, who they could be around. Um, but did you have any access to the team? And did you think it was a good thing? Kind of like what Clemson said about it's better that these guys be on campus and be playing football and be involved in the sport. Did you agree with that? Um, you know, yeah. I thought I thought you know because my opinion is you know you have so many different. Actually, I'm gonna pull that question back. I'm gonna pull that answer back. I'm gonna leave that to the experts. I think they did their research and they did what they felt was best. And then even with the players coming out and making the statements of hey, we want to play, we're fine. And then, you know, it just all depends on which study you read. So I think they were diligent enough and they made the right decision based on, you know, the information that they had. So um, I feel like it it, it was okay. I mean, they came out pretty well. Yeah, I agree, too. I think I think having guys together in an area where they can be supported and be around a staff that cares about them, medical facility that's, you know, top notch. Uh, nutrition and things like that. I think it was a good thing. I'm glad because we're all Clemson fans and we can watch them play. Um, talking about the team specifically, you know, this last team, obviously Trevor Lawrence is now going to the NFL um, and DJ is stepping into that starter role. Uh, what are your thoughts or what kind of advice do you give uh, players who are stepping into that starter role? Even, even if it's not quarterback, just what kind of advice do you give them, uh, you know, with the, the the things that the challenges they may face now being kind of the man? Well, the, the first advice is, you know, to be you. Because you think about following after a Todd Boyd or following after the Sean Watson and then following after the Trevor Lawrence. You look at that and you, you have the tendency to come in and try to, you know, make the same name or make that same hype or live up to whatever shoes that they had. No, blaze your own trail. So be who you are. Understand what your strengths and weaknesses are. Capitalize on your on your strengths. Grow your weaknesses, but just be you. That's the biggest advice. And then, you know, whatever position that they're playing, 
you know, just it's just the football aspect of it. You know, take care of your body. Make sure you learn the playbook in and out. Understand what's happening on the other side of the ball. You know, get as much knowledge as possible so when you're out there, everything is just reaction and second nature. You know, mm-hmm. so that's the biggest thing. But the biggest advice is, you know, for that individual athlete to be themselves because you can actually you can you can put yourself in a hole trying to fill someone else's shoes or be like the one that was right before you. Yeah, I, I can see that too because Trevor Lawrence is is different than than DJ, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Right. Um, they both have something that they can bring to the table, and you, as you could see, we saw with the Notre Dame game. I don't know if you were able to catch that game, but he stepped in. He showed that he can hold his own in a, in a difficult environment, even with less less uh, you know fans there. It still was you know on the road at Notre Dame, kind of a big big environment, uh, historical place. And um, he still was able to hold his own and, oh, yeah. and do well in that well situation. In that yeah, he played extremely well in that game. You know, like you mentioned, you know, being on the road, you're in a different environment. Not only are you, you know, making your first start, but you're playing on the road in, in, a un, in an unfamiliar environment and know the, the fans were there. But there were enough fans in there, you know, to create a distraction if you allowed it to be so. So, I mean, considering everything, that just shows you um, his capabilities but also it just shows you how, you know, Coach Coach Elliott and Coach Streeter were able to get him prepared, you know, for that game. That that speaks to their coaching style and their philosophies to be able to put him in a position to, to be successful. Now, talking to, continue to talk about the team this year, one of the struggles that, that you know, we're, we're a fan show, obviously graduates, part of the roar, but – one of the things that we we talked about was the struggles or the, the things that the quarterback had to overcome as far as Trevor and the offensive line and and uh, Travis Etienne in the offensive line. As a quarterback, you know, does it when how do you handle plays where you don't have a lot of time? Do you, is it something that you just have to kind of think on your feet and make a decision as fast as possible, and or is it something that you try to prepare for in practice or or how does that go? Absolutely. That's something you try to prepare for in practice. So um, that's the biggest thing of understanding what the defense does. And that's one thing I learned early. You know, if you can prepare for as many possibilities as possible, when they happen, you're not surprised and you're able to you're able to do something. So, hey, what happens if my guard gets ready? My guard just, you know, trips on the center's leg and he falls down and the guy comes through scot-free. You know, what am I going to do? Where, who can I get? So it's just thinking through thinking through the process that way. So you think through the normal stuff of what the play is designed to do, who is it designed to affect, and how you plan to attack it. But then also you start thinking about one-offs. What happens if this? What happens if that? You know, as you think through those processes and what could happen, then when they happen, again, you're not surprised. You're able to you able to make the proper response to it, even if it's just, hey, I'm going to fall to the ground and make sure I don't make it a worse play than what it already is. So <laughs> that that's that's what you do. It, it's all in planning and preparation. We've got some fans in the chat right now. I'm going to pull it over, pull it up on the screen. But uh, Mark Palmer gets in. He says that kickoff return that Woody had when he played for the Cowboys was amazing. And that's still one thing that you can go YouTube and, and check it out. Uh, I believe it was like an 86, 90 yard kickoff return. Uh, what what was your what was your memory of playing for the Cowboys, playing in the NFL there? Oh, it was fun. I, I enjoyed meeting people. I enjoy interacting with people and then to be in a locker room with, you know, with some great individuals, not just great players, not legendary players or Hall of Fame players, but just great guys in general, you know, great organizations. So I I thoroughly enjoyed myself. I got a chance to learn from a lot, from from some good people, both on and off the field. So I really cherish my time, you know, with the Dallas Cowboys because it was it was a good time to grow as an individual, but it's also a great time to grow as a player as well. So it was absolutely fun. Well, I'll pass it back around to Houston. Uh, you got anything you want to add in or any more questions that might pop up for you? Yeah, so I was just going to go ahead and, and toss this because I'm seeing a lot of questions on, on the chat about different games or let's talk about this game or that. Game. So I kind of want to like bring this all together at one point. And you see the picture that we got up there of the, the humanitarian bowl in 01. 
So is there a place – and when I talk to, I talk to former players that will say, like, man, I hated playing at this place because the, the, the grass was just – you know, the, the, the turf was terrible. I couldn't get my footing. Or, man, I love playing at that place. It was just, you know, it was just a smooth sailing kind of game. It was fun to play at. So what was, in your opinion, the place where you just were like, God, oh, i got to go there again. I can't stand it. And then on the other side where it was like, man, I love playing there. That was the, the best place to go and, and, and be in that environment. So, like, each of that, that side of the coin. Well, for me, I never had any of those places because all the fields that I played on had the same distance between the goal lines and the same from <laughs> sideline to sideline. And, you know, it may be some different colors. But for me, it was all the same. And for, and for the most part, um, I say this all the time. People are like, how is that the case? You know, crowd noise. When I played – all I heard was what was going on around me. I never heard the fans. I never heard the crowd. I heard my coaches. I heard my players, but I didn't hear anything else. I didn't see anything else. So no matter where I was, I was able to just focus in and play. So it didn't matter where I was. We could have been playing at one of the local high schools. You know, the field is just the field. So I'm, I'm just, I, I don't regret. I don't not. I don't have a place where I didn't want to play. A place I always look forward to playing. It's just I just look forward to playing. Period. Yeah, that's awesome. It's one of those things where I feel like it's uh, it, that's what the fans think about, you know, and the actual players are like, whatever, it doesn't really matter to me. Just put me anywhere, anytime, give me some pads. But that's stuff that, like, uh, we on the show, we talk about plenty of time, uh, you, know, you know, about all the different things outside, um, you know, that might affect the player. Um, but so, Alan, you got anything for Woody before we uh, – kind of move on and wrap up? Well, I was going to uh, tell them about uh, the, the catch two. I was in the box seats for the catch two. It's one of the, one of the seasons I had box, uh, box seats with my dad. Uh, and actually I always talk about on this show, the crowd noise and how awesome it is and how I love to hear it. And the roar of the crowd when it's a big play. And obviously that's one of the biggest plays in Clemson history, but you didn't hear it because you said you don't, you don't hear the fans in the crowd. So that's, that's no fun. And I wish I wasn't have been in the box for that. I wish I would have been outside. Uh, but you know, we have people on the line over here talking about the catch too. talk about the catch too. talk about the, uh, the Georgia tech game, which was incredible, by the way. Uh, do you have a favorite moment, a favorite moment in a game or a favorite game in general? I do not. Um, I guess, I guess, you could, I put some of those in the category because when you play against a certain amount of guys, you know, you get a, a respect for them and you look forward yep. to playing against It's like playing your brother or playing your cousin or playing your friends out, out at home in the backyard. So I always look forward to um, playing NC State um, because I grew up, I grew pretty close to and still to this day, LeVar Fisher, he and I are good friends. So it's always looking out to see who can get the best of one another. And I, you know, playing against Florida State, Chris Hope, you know, he was from South Carolina as well. You know, up in I think he played at Rock Hill High School. We didn't play, but we were both from South Carolina, so we had a relationship. We knew one. So just these different guys that I knew, it was just fun to get out there and compete against one another. Nothing malicious, nothing um, <laughs> um, crazy. But, you know, we get out there, we talk a little. Well, I didn't talk much because I was too focused on what I was doing. But they would talk and say different things. You know, we joke around after the game or when we mm-hmm. get together. But I look forward to every game because it was somebody on that other side that I built the relationship I got to know or just from watching film and you see how someone plays ball you just respect their game you look forward to going out and playing against that individual because you know if i can be successful against this guy or these guys Mm -hmm. then you know i've actually done pretty well i'm doing pretty well for myself so that's what it's all about just the spirit of competition and camaraderie and and loving to play the game against you know high quality uh, players well I appreciate you coming on the show, Woody. And and I was looking at this post that you had for Black History Month from your from your work that you were spotlighted this month. Uh, and one of the things that I that I I was reading in there was was something that I kind of related to as far as your transition from football to to the real world, the you know the civilian life, if you will, the 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 nine to five type job. I, w- I was in the military before going into college, and so it was kind of hard for me to kind of get out of that military mindset into you know the real world. So, you know, what do you tell football players, especially in the paw journey? I guess that's kind of where I'm going with this. Is 
when, when these guys are like, hey, you know what? This is my last year. I'm not going to get to go to the NFL. Or even those guys that you may meet that were kind of like you where, hey, I, I got the I got the NFL experience. But, yeah, it is time for me to, you know, uh, go look for a job in the workforce. Uh, what do you tell those guys? Just to to recognize that those skills that you needed to play football translate so well into the rest of life. Um, you think about what what um, football or any sport for that, that matter um, brings out of an individual. You know, the ability to work in within a team environment, the ability to overcome, the ability to push through, discipline, you know, character, all these different things that the football or what sports teach you. You could take that in any company. Case in point, when I came out and it was time to get into pharma, again, I had no experience whatsoever. The, the application required that you had uh, have uh, three years of pharmaceutical experience and one year of diabetes experience. I had zero. So honestly, they shouldn't even look at my um, application, but I was able to take my skills and leverage it in such a way that I made myself a viable candidate and end up getting a job over people who were much based on uh, experience, were much more experienced than I was. But my qualification that I brought from the field of play translated so well and allowed me to get the job that I've been here since, you know, 2013 in this industry. And another thing you said on there was about someone who inspired you. You know, you inspired us with your play on the field and, and really the the information and the, the the talk that you've given us tonight. But I know I know kind of what your answer is going to be because I've already read it. But can you tell us, like, tell our fans or viewers tonight, like, who is who is the one person you would say that's inspired you to be the person you are? Well, you know, outside of my, my, my family, my mom and my dad, but I mean, since then, you know, I've been married, like I said, going on 12 years and it's my wife. She pushes and stretches me. So, I mean, she won't allow me to be less than my best. She won't allow me to settle for, I can't do that. I don't know how, or she would just won't allow me to settle. So she pushes me, she stretches me and she challenges me to be greater. And that's what a wife is for. That's what marriage is all about. You know, building one another up, growing one another and making each other better you know, and that's, and that's what she does to me. She just, she pushes me so hard. Sometimes I want to push her back, but um, <laughs> she might kick my behind and I'm not, I want to be embarrassed. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I think it's great because a lot of people look at superheroes, sometimes, you know, look to football players, but have heroes right inside their house and have people that are pushing them, motivating them. Uh, and so I, you know, I thought it was great that you mentioned that as well. Um, but before we go, I want to wrap it up by letting our fans know or letting you tell our fans how they can follow you, how, how they can keep up with you, maybe uh, maybe even join some events that you might be a part of. Well, yeah, we um, well, I'm, um, you can find me on all social media outlets uh, for I guess it's whatever. My brain sometimes just stops working. But yeah, Facebook, I'm on Facebook, Woodrow Dance. You can find me there. Uh, you can find me on Instagram at Woody Dance for the third. Yeah, and I'm also on twitter still trying to figure this twitter thing out it's one day i'll learn how to really work it but i'm on twitter as well but that's under my my business name dancer three so that's dancer I, I so you can find me there as well i'm also on linkedin but um like i mentioned i do speaking engagements if you're looking to book me for a speaking gig i want to get me in info at dancer 3.com is the best way to get in contact with me that's my email i'm kind of sporadic on social media but if you send that email at info at dancer 3 that's dancer with i i i representing three.com you know that's the easiest the quickest way to get in touch with me well again woody on behalf of myself and big al in houston we thank you for being a part of the show for answering all of our questions the interrogation is finally over you have finished your obligation with the morgan thomas show uh but again 2007 clemson hall of famer woody dancer thank you again for joining morgan big al houston it's been an absolute pleasure love you guys take care appreciate the opportunity to hang out Thanks so much, Woody. Appreciate it. Well, that is not the end of the show. As you know, we're not going to, we're not, we're not going to keep you off the, we're not going to oh, let you off that easy. End on a high, end on a high note, man. <laughs> not the end of the show. That's right. Maybe it is. Oh, man. We have to talk about 
no, we don't have to talk about really anything. That was great. I mean, I really awesome. appreciate what Woody did. I had to let him go because I know he was talking about eating and you know, me, uh, you know, I'm not, I know you guys can agree. We all, we all value our meal times, And no so we cannot, <laughs> we cannot let a man sit there and be hungry while he's on this show. We had to let him through, but we got people already getting in saying a great interview, Bill, Al, Thank you so much for, for hanging through and watching uh, the show with us again on Facebook or YouTube. We really appreciate it. Great stuff. So Alan, the reason why it came all about, I'm, you know, Houston gets on to me because I'm the, I'm kind of the hashtag no guest guy. I just would rather talk to my buddies and leave it be and uh, then hang it up. Um, but you know, the fans ask for guests. Houston asks for guests, begs for guests, grovels for guests. Whoa, 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 whoa. whoa. That's right. That's right. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Wow. Maybe I'm maybe I'm maybe I'm embellishing this a little bit. Maybe maybe, but uh, um, not you. <laughs> but you know, Big Al has been a friend of mine for gosh since kindergarten. Really, I mean, I think maybe preschool. He's the guy <laughs> brought me from the bottom. Now we're here, kind of guy. So Alan, yeah. I love you, man. I gave I, I I know that you love Woody Dantzler as a lot of the fans that are watching this show. I wanted oh, yeah. to get Woody on um, because I got I got my star, Mister T O Terrence Oglesby on. So I had to get you. <laughs> Uh, Woody Dantzler um, <laughs> as well. You know, it was great. Like I said, I think I think it's awesome to see what these players are able to do. Again, Woody was able to have a great football career and then, you know, springboard that into his successful sales career as well. And not only that, he didn't forget about everybody else that's still going through it. And he goes back and helps with the paw journey. And that's what makes Clemson a Clemson family. That's why we're so different. And, you know, it's not just an NFL factory. It is about creating men that will help this help the society become better, pe you know, be better as, as a whole and better people, you know. So that's what I love about Clemson. And that's why I wanted to be a Clemson Tiger so bad. Also, because, you know, orange is just better than anything else. But um, all right, guys. So before we wrap it up, we're kind of close to the nine o'clock hour. Do we have anything? We have anything pressing, any, any, any concerns, emotional outbursts, anything that you want to just get off your chest? before we hang it up and we come back next week, actually on the mark, just to keep up with Houston's request. I've got facts and Childress lined up for next week. Mark Childress's son, who is up and coming in the broadcast industry. And he is, I believe getting ready to, uh, or, or at least looking to become a tiger himself. So, um, we're going to have him next week, talk about Clemson basketball and all other things as well. But Al, you got anything, my friend? Well, I do need to give you a couple ads, if you don't mind. Can I do that right now? Yes, that is true. That is true. You were supposed to do that. See, this is why we still have a whole other segment to go. You're still not off the hook. <laughs> so, first of all, we're going to start out with Daniel Weber State Farm. Uh, for your, all your insurance needs, call Daniel Weber State Farm. Our team is located in the heart of Clemson, South Carolina, and our goal is to protect, educate, and serve our customers and community. We specialize in auto and home insurance, as well as life insurance and health insurance. Our goal is to help protect your family and your finances. Give us a call today at 864-722-9083. Again, that number is 864-722-9083. So uh, here's a recent five-star Google review. Katie and Nikki and Daniel, you guys are the best. Really helped international students like us and super patient answer all my questions and explain every single detail to me. The best insurance branch ever. Solve problems really quick and being so nice to handle all the things without letting me worry about anything ever. Uh, love State Farm and love Daniel Weber branch. Five stars recommended to all my friends and anyone reading this, no doubt. So Daniel Weber is is definitely an, an awesome guy. Known him for a long time. Played a lot of basketball with him. Uh, I'm sure he would get on here and tell you who was the better player. Uh, but we're not going to have him do that tonight. Now, we, we love Daniel. It's, uh, definitely give Daniel a call. He's an awesome guy. So also... Uh, our last sponsor I want to get with is Heating Cooling Services, Inc., somebody who has been there from the beginning almost. Heating Cooling Services, Inc., serving Anderson County and surrounding areas since 1980. Uh, Heating Cooling Services, Inc. is your residential and commercial comfort expert. Anything from preventative maintenance of your home HVAC system to overhauling a commercial chiller or anything in between. If you want to breathe easier and be nice and cool in your home or business this summer or cozy and warm in your home or business this winter, give Heating Cooling, cooling Services, Inc. a call. You're going to want to talk to Mark or Jaden Morgan. Uh, they are good people and they will take good care of you. Especially Morgan. Especially Morgan. I will take care right. of you as well if you need. Um, but we got some requests in the chat and I do want to talk about this because we got to talk about this. The Clemson basketball. What? Why? We're winning. Why would you want to talk about it? We. Oh, I see what you did there. I see. That's what you did right. 
<laughs> See, we, no, we don't only talk about when they're losing. Okay. Houston, he's talking to you too. So you better hold it. I'm talking to both of you. <laughs> yeah, I know exactly what he means here. I, you know, I, I, I was going to let that slide. Um, you got a soundboard. Was that a soundboard going on? Over there? Yeah. <laughs> uh, they're winning. They're winning. I'm, I'm glad. I'm happy. They're winning. I'm happy. I really am. I'm not going to go on a tangent. I'm going to leave it at that for the public. <laughs> Just when Al Coon thought that we had given up the soundboard, Houston actually has picked it up and taken over for the <laughs> Houston. That's what you should do. That's what you should do. You should be soundboard guy from now on. Alan can be Alan can be chat room guy and put up the chat uh, comments. And you can be soundboard guy. I, I think you'd be great at it. I would just have fart noise. That's that's all it would be. <laughs> fart noises could be good too. My daughter would love it. She's all into like making funny fart noises, but um you know, I just try to tell her not in public, not in public. Stop, stop, stop it. But um, yeah, so clips of basketball. I watched the Syracuse game. By the way, last year I called the Syracuse game on YouTube. They won. It was a lot closer, a lot closer for that game. This game, very surprised. And Bill and I have talked on Twitter plenty of times back and forth about the Clemson basketball team. But you got to give them a shout out because people, everybody wants to say, you know, get rid of Brad Brownell. I don't understand why they can't make adjustments in game as fast because I feel like they could have made these adjustments. I don't know, you know, a couple of games ahead of time. But for whatever reason, it took them a while to get these adjustments. But Brad Brownell, for as frustrating as he can be, makes the right adjustments for the team to be successful after, you know, you know, stubbing his toe. Now we would love for him not to stub his toe, but that's not realistic. I mean, this team's never going to go undefeated in the ACC of all things for sure. But I would say it's nice to see them one going to the basket, not just chucking up threes. Alan and I have talked about this many times, just reminds us of our old church basketball team where, where you just, <laughs> with, you you get any sort of space, you're chucking the three. Absolutely. And, and that 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 works if you're on fire, but most of the time it never works. Actually, actually, let me take that back. That kind of stuff never works. It doesn't work for Clemson either. They get in these ruts, and it's like I think it's like uh, the Tevin Mack syndrome. Sometimes Tevin Mack would be on, you know, every seven games, and mm -hmm. those other six games it'd be like, what? Stop shooting the three. You're not going to get out of this rut right now. Um, but I, it's <clears throat> nice to see them using Amir Sims down low. Nice to see. I want to see more. You know what was great last year? John Newman driving to the basket. I mean, that dude was so strong getting to the basket, and he hasn't seemed to be doing that this year. Nice to see him do that, but it can't hurt, like Houston was saying, can't hurt when you start hitting the shots from the three-point arc as well, like Nick Otter was able to do. And so when the team and, – and the announcers mentioned this too. This, this kind of goes back to what Houston's been telling me since day one. When the team is on, like they were with Syracuse, not many teams in the nation that can hang. And you kind of see that. I mean, Al, do you agree? Yeah, I mean, look, here's the thing. And what's so frustrating about this is this Clemson team is, for the most part of this year, I'd say for the most part of this year, 60%, 70% of this year, they played really good basketball. They've played tough D. They've gotten all over people. Uh, they've shot the ball decent, uh, you know, and pretty well at times. Uh and then there's this, you know, they just lost four out of five by, you know, 20 plus per game almost. I mean, that was it. That was insane. And, you, you know, you can I can buy one game coming back from COVID and all that kind of stuff. Maybe two if you stretch it. But four out of five by that margin is incredible. Uh, and that's what's so frustrating. Usually, you know, by this point in the season, you know what kind of team you are. Are you a bad shooting team? Are you a good shooting team? You know, if you're a good shooting team, you're going to have five games where you shoot well and you're going to have an off game. And that's fine because you're going to get right back to it the next game. Or you you know you're a bad shooting team, so you're going to take it to the hole all the time and play good defense every time, and then you're going to have an off game, and that's fine. This team is so crazy because they're killing people or they're getting blown out. This is like the complete opposite of what we've had at, at Clemson basketball, these close games, close losses, close wins, depending on the year. Um, it's just tough to figure out what team are we. Are we the team that has has beaten Louisville and beaten Florida State, or the, are we the one that has lost to, to Duke by, you know, 20 or 30 or whatever it was and in Florida State as well. I just – I can't figure it out. All I know is right now we're playing pretty well, uh, beating North Carolina and beating Syracuse, uh, and I, I'm good with it. You know, I, I mean, I just I just wish I knew what kind of team we were because you can't expect a team that has looked this sporadic to make as much noise in the tournament as you want. Obviously, right now, you know, we would be projected into the tournament, you know, and, and, and that's kind of a – that's kind of everybody's goal. You want to be in the tournament and be able to make some noise and – 
we, we did that a couple of years ago. Gabe DeVoe got hot, and, you know, he cooled off a little bit when we ran into Kansas. We ended up losing. Uh, you know, and, and this team can give a lot of people fits in the tournament if they're having a good shooting night. But we just don't know if that's going to happen, and I don't think they've shown enough consistency to make us believe they're going to be able to go on a run and consistently do it this year. So it'll be interesting to find out where they go, but I, I'm sure pulling for them, that's for sure. Yeah, I would say this team, like I've, I've been telling Morgan, this this team has talent to make a deep run in the tournament. They have yeah. the talent. It's just what goes on between the ears uh, as far as as far as far how how far this is going to carry. Because I, I could honestly see, that, and to me, I think the next four games are going to define, and, and really it'll be pretty much the end of the season by that point, but you have three road games in a row, and two of those road games are against teams that you should definitely beat. Um, if you finish the next four games three and one or better, I think Clemson could have a lot of momentum going into conference tournament and maybe maybe kind of be in that, that trajectory to start, maybe have some dark horse talk of making a, a deeper run. But, you know, if you're two and two, one and three, it's, yeah, I don't know. We don't know what's going to happen. But, you know, with this team, you don't know. This team could maybe inch its way into the tournament and then just all of a sudden take off. It happened to South Carolina in 2017. They were not the most talented team, but they got hot. They went from shooting like 30-something percent to 65% overnight and ended up making it all the way to the Final Four. Mm -hmm. Clemson could do that. I'm not, I'm not saying that that could happen verbatim, but they have the talent to do something like that. What was the, what was the guard forward guy's name for Carolina that year? I mean, he got hot. Dwayne Notice. Remember. It was Dwayne wow. Notice. Uh, Dwayne Notice and um, – I thought it started I with an S. I'm Rocky thinking of the – Rocky Felder, that was the other one. I'm thinking of the five star guy, the big tall, the the taller guy. Oh, uh, Cinderius Thornwell and uh, there you go, Thornwell. Yes. That's the one I'm thinking about. Yeah, that's who I was thinking about as well. Swim, swammy, swammy, Cinderius, <laughs> Cinderius. That's what it was. Um, who does? And before we go, uh, I wanted to throw this up here real quick. His account, it's a all sports schedule on ClemsonTigers.com, just to kind of check in. So we've got. Let's see, Thursday, women's basketball versus NC State. I, I do this for Bill because Bill wants <laughs> us to include more sports, and we always just get stuck on one sport. So I want to make sure we give everybody some love here. You see that volleyball versus North Florida Friday. Big time Friday, though. We got uh, Tiger Paw Invitational track and field there uh, at Clemson Indoor Track and Field Complex. And then you've got, look at this, fellas. Guys, it is February 9th. This is February 12th, this Friday softball starting it up baby versus <laughs> Illinois State uh in Jacksonville in the River City leadoff looks like that's a tournament there in Jacksonville North Florida and then um they've got men's tennis also and men's basketball as well uh Friday and then you got a couple of things on the weekend volleyball track and field uh tennis and then I think if correct me if I'm wrong but softball starts this week if you scroll down or maybe maybe load some more next week, oh boy, look at it right there. Baseball, Friday, <laughs> 19th, Cincinnati comes to Clemson. Houston, are you going to be at that game? Oh, uh, you know, probably not uh, given <laughs> given the current circumstances that I'm dealing with at home. Uh, Just sneak away. You know, I might maybe 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 one day this year. Potentially. <laughs> Just sneak away. Uh, yeah. No, but, you know, I, I'm excited. I think Al's going to have a big primer on this next week. I personally think that, that Clemson's baseball team was trending to make a deep run in the postseason, whether that was into the Supers or to Omaha last year with the pitching. I think the pitching is that. I don't want to steal Alan's thunder. He's Mr. Baseball. And I think <laughs> Clemson's priming to be a dark horse in the ACC this year. Yeah, this could be this could be fun. I'm excited about baseball. I'm always excited about baseball. I'm I'm very bitter that last year ended and we didn't get to see Sam Weatherly take his career on through a, you know Clemson and, and take us into the playoffs. He was the true Friday night ace. Uh, you know, and just kind of uh, as a teaser, like they're they're mentioning, I'm I'm looking to do a little section of my own, something something uh, like around the bases with Big Al, and uh, we're gonna talk a little baseball. I'm gonna have one of our one of our uh, watchers that's gonna be with us, one of our viewers, uh, Corey Welch. You'll see him comment from time to time. Uh, he is a he is a baseball guru, ladies and gentlemen. He does a lot of work with some of the players around here, and he's going to kind of get on with me and talk about Clemson uh, Clemson baseball. He knows a lot of the players, knows the rosters, and uh, he he's a Georgia fan. We're not going to hold that against him for this because 
he he knows his stuff, guys. He knows his stuff. He was a great player uh, back in the day. I'm sure I'm sure he can still play uh, with the best of them. So we're going to get that going. It's going to be a lot of fun. But for the baseball fans out there, it should be good. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much, whether you're Facebook, YouTube, or wherever you're watching and listening. Thank you so much for being a part of this show again tonight. Another Tuesday night, 8 p.m. Again, Facebook uh, on our channel or on uh, the Roars channel and then over on YouTube as well. Whoever got in and got in the chat, we hope we got to you. We hope you threw you up, uh, you know, your your name or whatever. If we didn't get you a shout out, come on next week. We'll get you a shout out. But again, for myself, Big Al and Houston, we hope you have a good rest of the week. And as always, Tiger fans, we'll see you at the top of the hill. <laughs>